Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. St. Matthew 11, 6. One of the expressions I hear most often when talking to people about God is the phrase, I can't believe in a God who would do X. With X being whatever activity of God my conversation partner happens to disagree with. There are usually all sorts of different reasons why a person will repeat this phrase, although it usually has to do with a refusal to believe in a God bigger than themselves or bigger than their commitments to things like family traditions or political parties or charismatic college professors or even videos they've seen on the internet. It's fascinating. Most people would be better off just stopping three words into this phrase and ending with, I can't believe. This declaration would at least have the advantage of being honest and understandable without involving some straw man version of God invented to make themselves feel better as they beat or ignore the dumb idol to whom they've chained themselves. Belief, as we see in our lives and the lives around us, is not a thing easily grasped. And it is certainly not the normal mode of human existence. We must be convinced of the truth of a claim before we believe it. Or at least that's what we tell ourselves. But how well do we know the truth in a world with so many different people claiming to be the only ones telling us the truth? The modern world has given us access to endless streams of information that more and more only serve to tell customers what they want to hear. To create a fictional world of heroes and enemies to cheer on and hate in our own mass media version of the Colosseum. Within this violent world of conflict, the Christian is constantly faced with a choice. Do we follow the God who has revealed himself in history, a record guarded and passed down to us in the scriptures and living memory of the church, or do we cheer on today's false gods who more perfectly fit the false picture of God we have been insidiously taught to love by the very secular sources we turn to for entertainment and news and morality. We are all participants in this mass delusion to some extent or another. None of us are immune. We are all caught in the net of anger and lies that eat away our days and too often fill us with a dread for the future. After all, our great enemy's goal is to paralyze us with fear and distract us from the real war that is being waged every day in the homes and hearts of a lost humanity. And my God, no one could come up with a better mousetrap than the modern world in which we live. The evil one knows us so well that he has built a prison in the shape of the human heart. It is a prison of a different sort that we visit in today's gospel reading. A place where the man chosen by God to be the last and greatest prophet of the Messiah feels the full burden of what it means to be God's chosen one in a fallen world plagued by a rebellion against its creator. St. John the Baptist enters the biblical story after 400 years of prophetic silence, declaring to an apostate people, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. His ministry takes place in the wilderness, an evocative location through which the prophet could act out the 40-year wilderness wandering of the Israelites, a physical way of saying, now is the time for a radical repentance, a time to flee the city 
corrupted by a compromised religious and ruling class, a time to repent in the penitential wilderness and be cleansed in the river through which the Israelites passed in their first attempt to purify themselves and the world under the command of Moses' successor, Joshua. We see this connection even more clearly when we remember that Joshua and Jesus have the same name in Hebrew. John the Baptist is getting the people ready for the Messiah and the reckoning that this prophesied king will bring, particularly for those who have benefited from compromising themselves and their people in an evil world. John cries in the wilderness, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. St. Matthew 3, 11 through 12. It should not surprise us that John's message made the ruling class uncomfortable. After all, he's telling them the Messiah is coming and he's bringing fire and a list. John's uncompromising preaching did indeed get him in trouble with Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, who is such a prominent feature of our Christmas narratives. Herod the Great was a king who was so frightened by the possibility of the advent of the Messiah that he murdered all the young boys in Bethlehem, an event we still mourn three days after Christmas. Herod Antipas, his son, had merely seduced his brother's wife while visiting Rome, divorced his own wife, and then married his brother's wife in a public flouting of the Jewish law. He was a real chip off the old block. John the Baptist is in prison for preaching against this and he will eventually be executed through the evil plotting and sexual blackmail of Herod's adulterous wife. However, when John sends his disciples to confront Jesus, he is suffering in the prison fortress of Machaerus in the burning mountains adjacent the Dead Sea. This was not a pleasant place. John has heard about the ministry of Jesus, the cousin, he had baptized in the Jordan River, the man he had seen God the Holy Spirit touch and God the Father proclaim, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. John has been a witness to indisputable evidence that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one to come. He has seen the creative force of the universe working together to begin the redemption of the Trinity's beloved world. And yet, in the fiery torture chamber of an evil king, John hears about his cousin and Lord doing something he does not expect. He hears from his loyal disciples that Jesus is wandering around the countryside preaching and teaching and healing the poor. John hears about these peculiar acts and sends a message to Jesus. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? St. Matthew 11:3. Now, we can certainly understand why John would ask this question. He is, after all, chained up like an animal. And he, like all of Jesus' disciples, expects the Messiah to bring the judgment and fire that will topple the unworthy leaders like his jailer, Herod. John expects his cousin to purge the land of evil and free him from prison. John expects Jesus to climb David's throne and become the great king he had been preparing his whole life to serve. 
John has an expectation of what the kingdom of God will look like. But within the pain and suffering this world brings to bear upon us all, especially upon God's chosen people, John cannot understand why Jesus is doing what he is doing. Even the great prophet cannot understand why God is acting in this peculiar manner. God is not saving the world the way John expected. And that reality must have been terribly, terribly frightening to John. Just as it is frightening and enraging when our own expectations are unfulfilled. Everyone in this room has faced the same crisis we hear in the pained message of John. Are you the one who will save me? Or do I need to keep looking? Or put another way, I can't believe in a God who would let children get cancer or let my mom die in pain or allow evil men to live unpunished or fill in the blank. But we who live in the prison of an evil, fallen world are only ever barely able to see the beauty of God's good world through our cell's barred windows. We long for deliverance from this prison, even if we've only been able to tack on a few pictures to our cell's dark, cold walls. We know that our time on death row, and that's where we all are, we know that time is only a temporary stay. And we desperately want some great miracle, some great power to hold back the executioner's hand. But Jesus does not respond to our entreaties in the way the world expects. He does not respond to his people in the way the world has taught us to expect. God responds to us the same way he responded to John. And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. St. Matthew 11, 4 through 6. We may ask, what possible comfort could this bring to the imprisoned prophet? Or more personally, what hope can this declaration give to us fellow prisoners? The answer lies in the mysterious and unpredictable plan of God. A plan, a mission whose very strangeness points to the divine author whose alien character we will struggle to understand until we are face to face with him in the new earth to come. Jesus, through his allusion to chapter 35 of Isaiah's prophetic work, is putting the divine signature on every single action of his earthly ministry. For what comes directly before the verses quoted by our Lord. Isaiah writes, Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and so forth and so on. Behold, your God will come. He will come and save you. Do we dare see what Jesus is saying here? Jesus is revealing to John and everyone else who knows the prophecies of Isaiah and whose eyes have been opened to faith by God the Holy Spirit. He's saying to all of us that he is not just some new and greater David, though he is that too, but that much, much more importantly, Jesus is God. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. And he has come to save John and all his people from an enemy far greater than Herod 
or Tiberius Caesar or Hitler or fill in the blank. Jesus is announcing to his beloved cousin that he is more of a liberator than he could ever possibly have hoped for. He is the life of the new world. And he will not only save his cousin, he will remake the world and clothe his people in righteousness. He will tear down the powerful and raise up the humble and meek. So John has to see that he is not dealing with a simple man who will gain a golden throne for a season. No, John is inseparably connected to the God who will make all things new, whose throne is in heaven and whose enemies will inevitably be made his footstool. Jesus, through his words and actions, is revealing who he is. The healer of the sick, the destroyer of death, the creator of the new earth to come. We can only imagine what John the Baptist said when he heard this message of true hope brought back to him. It may have sounded something like St. Paul, another man left awestruck by the grace and mercy of God, who wrote in his doxology at the end of Romans chapter 11, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Romans 11, 33-36. John, of course, will carry this good news with him, even as he is unjustly murdered by the disgusting family that once ruled a portion of Judea. We, of course, are to carry this good news with us as we are constantly confronted by a fallen world intent on dragging us down into the muck and misery of its self-important suicide. In our context, the prison within which we exist is no less real because we pay to live in it. But our failure to transcend its walls through the word and work of Christ will have eternal consequences for us and for our neighbor. We must resist this world and its evil and lock arms as a church to stand firm against our already defeated enemies. We must recognize that by saving the world in the way we see, written in the blood on the pages of the New Testament and in the history of the faithful church, that Christ has given us a mission and a calling to drastically reorganize our priorities in a way that will inevitably lead to us being mocked by our friends and our families and our neighbors and our own sinful hearts. By following Christ in our every thought, word, and deed, we radically realign ourselves with reality, despite what every fallen emotion and temporary desire we have been taught to feel tells us. Jesus looks down to us from that cross and his people are forced to say in response to hell with the world and its expectations, to hell with the lusts I've been brainwashed into following. I will follow the creator of reality who saved the world with his suffering body. He is my king, my example, my everything and I will follow him wherever he leads me. I will not hide from his word, nor will I hide from experiencing the victory of his sacraments. I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I will carry my brothers and sisters on my back. I will be God's messenger this Advent, 
and I will prepare the way before him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.